Hey everybody, this video is sponsored by OKCoin Crypto Exchange. Why pay ridiculously high fees to Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance when you can use OKCoin, which has the lowest fees, guys? So if you want to save money on buying and selling and trading crypto, definitely have to use OKCoin. Sign up, link in the description. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. With me today is Congressman Tom Emmer. Uh, Congressman Emmer, it is an honor to be speaking with you today. Hey, Tony, it's my honor. Thank you for having me. It's a, It really is a fun to be with you this morning. Uh, let's start with your background. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I'm from the great state of Minnesota. I, uh, I'd like to tell people I grew up on a hockey rink that's at the intersection of Crosstown, uh, Highway 62, and Gleason Road in uh, on the western border of Edina, Minnesota. And what got you into politics? Uh, was that something you wanted to do when you were growing up or it just came along and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go serve my country? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I was going along in life like most people do. Well, maybe not most people, but uh, my wife and I have this great family. We have seven kids uh, running my own business. Um, and then, uh, you know, things change in life. I, I lost a sister, a younger sister to breast cancer caused me to think about uh, what we do every day in life. And I, I don't know exactly what happened, Tony. It was more like, you know what? Uh, you got to be involved. You got to, you know, life, you got to get every ounce out of every second of every minute of every hour of every day. And I just uh, started getting involved. I think it was the kids, right? Uh, they get you involved in your community. And before you know it, uh, life changes because you have one of these life-changing experiences that uh, it just, it's time to get involved. Next thing I knew, I was not just sitting on the local uh, church council or uh, later the city council. I was sitting in the uh, state legislature. And then before you knew it, I tried to get out. <laughs> I, everybody who's listening, I tried to get out of politics more than 10 years ago, and I did it by running for a statewide office. And, my goodness, uh, because I tried to get out, here I am, I'm sitting in Congress. And I guess what ended up happening, Tony, is uh, I, I, government to me, uh, we trust all these people to take care of it for us while we're doing these opportunities. Crypto in this whole space is a great example. All the people that are out there that are getting involved in this exciting technology and this exciting opportunity, uh, they think the people in government, uh, you know, they're not going to, they'll, they'll take care of that stuff. I'm going to take care of what I'm taking care of. And then they realize one day, you know what? These people in government can really screw up a good thing. Yeah. They can really get in the way. They can cause problems. They, uh, and I got to be involved. I got to lean in. I got to make sure they understand what they're doing to me, what they're doing in my community. And uh, I got to make a difference. And maybe that's a long winding way of saying, you know what? It was by accident that I got involved. A lot of things changed in my life and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I'm sitting here today, and I think uh, the, the mindset I bring with me is the one that our founders had. Uh, there's a place for government, but it's a very limited place. Uh, the, uh, the place that we want to experience the most uh, uh, excitement in this country is individual empowerment, giving people the opportunity to be the best they can possibly be or not based on their own initiative without government telling them what that is, where they can do it, how they can do it, and who they can do it with. Absolutely. And I'm so thankful that, you know, you are in office and I appreciate all the things that you've been doing. Um, someone said it the other day, I love my country, but I'm not very happy with my government right now. And I think that's kind of the sentiment of how I feel this morning with the infrastructure bill and what happened there. So I wonder if you can give us kind of the state of the union on crypto regulations in the United States, um, given that you maybe you can take us behind a curtain of what's happening here. Is it still maybe a lack of education of not understanding what is taking place or there are the other things? Is it you know a bit of politics and eventually we'll get there? So, uh, you know, a bunch of things you packaged up there, Tony. First off, that infrastructure bill. Uh, that's another example of, uh, Although we're going to find out because it's going to come over to the House. I don't know if it's ever going to get to the floor because there's a lot of politics that are involved here. And, you know, we got to flush out the system with some of these uh, longtime uh, representatives. Uh, 
uh, not the least of which is the uh, Speaker of the House. We, we need some new blood in the House. We need people who understand uh, crypto and everything else. The, uh, our population is moving on. Uh, you know, the, the mindset of Americans is not what it was 30 years ago. Uh, and by the way, Americans are getting sick and tired of government that doesn't work and all it does is fight. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to guess, Tony, that during your lifetime, because you're a little bit younger than me, you haven't had an opportunity to really see government work the way it was supposed to work. Mm. Uh, it really hasn't done its job since 1998 when it comes to passing budgets through the House and the Senate and across the president's desk. Last time, I think we did 12 appropriation bills through the House and through the Senate and had a uh, president sign them on or before September 30th, which is the last day of the fiscal year, might have been 1998. So uh, those of you that are listening out there, if you were born on or after 1998, you understand you haven't seen government work the way it's supposed to work in your lifetime. Uh, that being said, this uh, infrastructure bill, you know, they're trying to find any way that they can to fund it. And they, uh, they had a uh, Portman Amendment, which quite frankly is crazy. Uh, it's this a huge net that throws in miners, it throws in software developers potentially having to do uh, know your customer uh, compliance, which it, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Uh, you know, you ask me where we're headed. Look, uh, if you look at this thing, regulatory ignorance, it, frankly, is going to drive uh, crypto opportunities overseas. Uh, I'm going to suggest it's regulatory ignorance because we've got Janet Yellen at the Treasury who actually lobbied Portman's office for the uh, provision that would uh, put all these reporting requirements on everybody, uh, you know, whether they have something to report or not. Uh, Gary Gensler wants to expand the uh, regulatory net of the SEC when it comes to crypto. It's just insane. Michael Sue uh, wants to go back and uh, revisit uh, all these fintech charters. Uh, and by the way, when someone submits one, a case-by-case -case basis, how does that actually advance this industry? It doesn't. It doesn't because you have no certainty. And obviously, Jay Powell, uh, he's been very disappointed in me recently. When he makes statements like the government's going to have a central bank uh, digital currency, and that we don't need stable coins. If the government is that, uh, boy, that's a great idea. Let's have the government get into business competing with individual Americans. And by the way, you know, Jay, I would say this. Since when does the United States of America be the Communist Party of China? This is just, uh, so, uh, Tony, I, I'm sounding a warning alarm to uh, those that are watching your podcast, those that pay attention like you do to what's happening in this space. Uh, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, we were making some serious advances, by the way. This is nonpartisan, nonpartisan. This is not about Republicans and Democrats. This is about Republicans uh, having a political view. This is about Republicans and Democrats being either equally uh, invested in the space or equally ignorant in the space, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, we got a lot of work to do in bringing along more elected officials, bringing along more of the uh, bureaucracy and understanding the opportunity and the promise that this uh, industry can provide to America, Americans and people worldwide. Absolutely. So do you think a step that needs to be taken um, is a lot more crypto companies may need to educate, uh, do a lot more advocacy or lobbying things along those lines, and that can help move the needle on that front? Yeah, I do. I mean, you're going to have traditional banking folks that, uh, you know, unfortunately, look at me, uh, white-haired uh, guy, uh, 60 years old. I, the good news is I actually started studying this. You know, I have staff around me that are totally invested in this area. They got me excited about it six, seven years ago. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people who fit my stereotype they only know what they know from the past. They have not evolved. They have not educated themselves for whatever reason. Uh, they're coming along slowly. And I think uh, he, we all look differently. I'm using me as a poster child. But we, uh, you know, no matter where we come from, no matter what our race is, our gender, our, uh, you know, our religion, doesn't matter. We have a lot of work to do making sure people understand this is empowerment. This is about the individual. 
the opportunities that uh, you know crypto provides to people to be involved in the financial system are unlimited if we just get government out of the way or you know just have a light touch. There's no question that uh, and I think you and a lot of your uh, your colleagues would agree. You know, you got to be careful. You got to be aware, and some people just aren't uh, uh, equipped to deal with uh, some of the bad actors that you're going to run into. But this idea that uh, crypto involves just bad actors, I'm going to tell you, cash is still king when it comes to uh, people trying to get around the system. It's not crypto. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think throughout my life, I've seen that. Yeah, you, you want to get something done without the government knowing cash under the table. Right. Yeah, it's it's certainly not crypto and digital assets. And to your point, you know, you guess there is a balance there. You have to protect consumers. And look, there have been scams. I've seen some of them. I know some people who've gotten burned by them. So absolutely, the protection needs to be there. But you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think we got to get it right. We got to find that balance. That's exactly right, Tony. I mean, the point is, uh, it's it's kind of like this uh, Portman Amendment, which uh, obviously it's not about, well, it is it's a little bit, uh, about uh, uh, supervision uh, and oversight. It's more about collection of revenue, right? Mm. Uh, but the idea is still the same. You're going to paint with that broader brush. You're going to create that much uncertainty in the marketplace. Uh, government has a place. I'm not going to argue that it should be totally out. I'm not an anarchist. Uh, you know, it's not about not having any government. But I am going to tell you that in this space, the creativity, the people that are involved, uh, they are going to advance with or without their government. And the government needs to start figuring out, our federal government needs to start figuring out the opportunity that this provides and become a partner with the industry instead of becoming the boss of the industry. I think this is a, this is the problem. Our freedom, quite frankly, is based on our financial system, Tony. If you think about it, there's nowhere else in the world where a dumb schlub like me can walk into a local bank, right? This is the way it was designed, where I can walk into a local bank with an idea on a piece of paper, a business plan, and say to the local banker, hey, I, I got this great idea. Maybe it's the next Amazon. Maybe it's the next Walt Disney. Maybe it's the next Harley Davidson. Sure. I got this great idea. I need a little startup capital, right? Take a look at my idea. That's the place where this banker, quote unquote, can jump into this investment with me and take the risk with me. And I start, I start Harley Davidson in a garage. Mm -hmm. Your listeners know it started in a garage and it grows into this huge, wonderful company. This is just the next step in the evolution of our financial system. Uh, Tony and Tom get on a, uh, a blockchain uh, 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 platform. We start dealing in whatever the, uh, the crypto asset is or you know, whatever we're going to do in terms of a relationship between us. You may be trying to develop that next great company. Uh, this is a new way to, to create uh, transactions between individuals. And by the way, we take out the government, or more importantly, the middleman. In many cases, we have peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which that's actually good for business. That's good for our freedom. That's good for innovation and opportunity. This is why I'm, I'm a true believer, and I'm going to keep fighting against this idea that government's got to be the all-powerful, and government's got to be in every little crack and cranny of, uh, of our existence to know what we're up to. No, they don't. No, they don't. Absolutely. Um, can you tell us a bit about the folks you've been working with? Um, you mentioned there's bipartisan support. I know of Darren Soto, Warren Davidson. Have you worked with any of those gentlemen and uh, any other folks that you want to maybe give a shout out to? Oh, yeah. No, everybody on the Blockchain Caucus, your listeners can go Google it. Uh, the uh, And you've named Darren Soto is a great one that I work with. There's uh, several on my side of the aisle. You mentioned Warren Davidson, uh, who's filled in my position now on the FinTech Task Force as I got elevated to the uh, <laughs> ranking member of the Government and Oversight Committee. Uh, but I've never left uh, FinTech, and I'll continue to be involved. In fact, I'm going to tell you, uh, Tony, we need to have a crypto uh, or a uh, FinTech uh, subcommittee, a formal subcommittee. I'm not sure why Maxine Waters hasn't put one in. Yeah. Uh, 
but we really need to have that subcommittee. Uh, we've got to get the banking committee that it was once called, which is now the financial services committee in the house. It has to evolve, right? It has to be in the 21st century when it comes to uh, our financial services technology and all the opportunities it's creating. But, you know, I, I could give you a whole list of Democrats and Republicans who are working together on this topic. Uh, we all, you know, whether it's Bill Foster, uh, you, uh, you mentioned uh, Darren Soto, uh, we can go down that list, Republicans as well. But here's the problem. You also have Democrats and Republicans alike who just have not educated themselves and who are not leaning into this space. One that's very disappointing to me is a, is a friend, excuse me, from Virginia, uh, Don Beyer. Nice. Don Beyer's never been involved in this space, but he all of a sudden put in this bill a couple of weeks back that would be uh, all encompassing. And uh, it, it's like I, one, one part of me, Tony, is that's great, Don. I'm glad you're getting yeah. into the discussion, right? Right. Because the more people that get into it, the better the discussion will be, and hopefully we can bring them along. The other part of me is like, where are these people coming from that think they are going to put the brakes on this innovation? Because that's what it looks like. It looks like they want to they want to uh, have government suck up this entire industry hmm. and then dictate how it's going to develop, where it's going to develop. Could you imagine if this is how they would have handled the development of the internet itself? I mean, if government would have done this to the internet, we'd probably still be without email and without uh, all the great advances, simple advances that we've had over the last 30 years plus. So uh, no, it's it, the good news is there are Republicans and Democrats alike that understand how important this area is they're getting more involved every day because they realize government it has the uh, potential to be a serious wet blanket on uh, this development and the opportunities that it would provide. And we just got to work. Uh, we got to be extra vigilant on those that are, I don't know, they're, they're skeptical because they've just refused to open their minds to, uh, and maybe they're not able to, you know, this, this requires some thinking out of the box. Your generation, Tony, is a little bit different from mine. Mine thinks in a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. Yours thinks in three dimension. You actually see outside of what we do. And I don't think a lot of people understand that my age. I think they think that, uh, you know, they just, we have been trained to think a certain way because of what we grew up with, and they're not able to step out of that persona and say, wow, I mean, there is a different way to look at all this stuff. Good news is Republicans, Democrats alike are on our side. Uh, bad news is we still get a lot of Republicans and Democrats to bring along. <laughs> so what would, be, what would be the ideal scenario where we provide the regulatory clarity without the overreach? There's a balance there. Would it be a specific bill that is passed and it puts maybe the SEC in their respective place, the CFTC, and there's checks and balances, of course, right? Um, and I know you you provided a, uh, a or introduced a bill called the Securities Clarity Act. Is it that bill, or is there another one? It, what would be the process there? So I believe it is something like the Securities Clarity Act. My uh, my colleague Warren Davidson has the uh, Token Taxonomy Act. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, we have a difference of opinion. I I love Warren. He's one of my favorite uh, colleagues. Uh, he does think out of the box. Uh, we have a lot of great discussions about uh, many different things, including this. Most of it, your 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 viewers may get a kick out of the fact that Warren and I both have the same skepticism of government, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of fun. But look, his uh, token taxonomy bill, I believe, paints with too broad a brush. I think the Security Clarities Act, which creates a new definition for investment contract and actually starts to uh, help our securities law evolve to actually take in this industry uh, and allow for some clarity. So when you go out and you create these uh, new opportunities, you know how you're gonna be treated by the government. Uh, the problem I have with, uh, with not creating a new definition and trying to model the existing laws, uh, I shouldn't say model them, I would say, uh, uh, redesign existing law to actually apply to the current uh, uh, technology and opportunity. 
um, I think is a much better way to go about it rather than trying to create a new broad brush. Uh, look, I'm a lawyer. Uh, this is where Ward and I are different. I'm not interested in full employment for lawyers. I got no problem with lawyers. I, I, I'm like uh, most people, you love your lawyer when you need them, right? Right. <laughs> but we in government shouldn't be creating more confusion and more potential for lawyers to get hired to try and walk someone, an innovator, through the, uh, through the government bureaucracy. And I think the uh, Securities Clarity Act would limit that because it literally would give you a better idea of, okay, I'm creating an investment contract. Therefore, I'm not subject to these laws. I'm subject to those laws. That's one. Uh, we've got several others, though. You know, the Safe Harbor for Taxpayers Report uh, Assets Act, the Blockchain Regulatory Certainty Act. I think there are things that we have to be uh, uh, nimble. I think we have to be thoughtful uh, when issues come up. Uh, we, we do not want to have a situation where the regulators are actually legislating through enforcement. That's the biggest problem, Tony, is when we leave the regulators to themselves, and keep in mind, just like I told you, we got uh, Republicans and Democrats alike who understand this area or who are trying to educate themselves and understand this area. And we've got Republicans and Democrats alike who don't understand this area, and it scares them. Same thing with regulators. And the problem we have with regulators, which makes this uh, a really bad situation, is when they don't understand it and we don't have clear rules of the road, they wait until you, Tony, goes out and creates this next great thing. And then all of a sudden they jump on it. Uh, maybe it's the SEC. Maybe it's the FDIC. Maybe it's the uh, CFTC. You know, the alphabet soup of, uh, of bureaucracies in Washington, D.C., it suddenly jumps all over your idea. And now guess what? You got to hire a whole bunch of lawyers and you got to start uh, uh, having a debate with your government over what rules you're subject to, what uh, compliance you have to meet. That's no way to allow innovation to, uh, to grow in this country. And I think that's why something like the Securities Clarity Act is so important. Sure. And, you know, I've seen Gary Genser and folks at the SEC talk about they still want to use the Howey test, but it's like an 80 year old test. And I, you know, like you're saying, I think there needs to be an update there because it's apples and oranges here. Uh, <laughs> I know the, the original issue with Howey was with the orange growth. The orange growth, right. Yeah. Right. But see, that that's why you would take this uh, Securities Clarity Act would take the Howey test. And now it would create this new uh, concept of an investment contract. Because you and I both know you can have something that initially starts out as a security in this area, but doesn't ultimately, uh, it's not ultimately a security when it's all done. So should the uh, SEC be all powerful when it comes to this? I don't think so. I don't think so. And you have to have uh, clear definitions. So you know the on-ramp, you know the off-ramp, you know who's going to be responsible for you, and you, you know you know what you need to comply with before you got to hire a bunch of attorneys and start paying them to figure out how you uh, how you walk this federal legend government. Now, you uh, last year you stated that XRP is not a security, and obviously the SEC has a very big lawsuit against Ripple right now, um, and it has a lot of eyeballs on it because I think the outcome is. You know, a lot of people are waiting to see what happens here because that might be how the SEC judges the rest of the market. Um, and I, we're hoping that Ripple comes out with a victory. And, you know, me as an XRP holder and someone who earns XRP as being a content um, producer, because through something called Coil and web monetization and people tip me and things like that, um, I'm very disappointed in the SEC. And, and I don't know. I, well, I want to get your perspective because it's, it, you know, you publicly stated XRP is not security. And what, what are your thoughts on the entire lawsuit situation? Well, I'm going to be careful, right? It's, uh, I practiced law before I went into uh, uh, elected office. And you really, really should refrain from commenting on, uh, you know, in detail on what a court is charged with trying to resolve, right? You've got the, the government and the folks at Ripple are trying to resolve a disagreement. Uh, you point out accurately, Tony, that the resolution could have some significant ramifications on the marketplace. Uh, but that's a great example of 
legislation through enforcement instead of the way we should be doing it, which is elected uh, leaders like myself should be sitting down with the industry, with you and your, your colleagues and saying, all right, what's the answer to this question? I mean, by the way, a great example, because Gensler has been very disappointing to me recently. I just, based on his comments, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm afraid that this is gonna be more of the same, but Jay Clayton wasn't much better. He's brilliant too. Jay Clayton is a, uh, a brilliant guy. And I just, uh, I had hoped for more uh, help in this area from these, uh, from these leaders and they just didn't give it to us. Brian Brooks, on the other hand, uh, who was at the OCC, phenomenal. Phenomenal forward thinker, uh, thoughtful. Uh, he was uh, easy to work with. We need more people like Brian Brooks in these positions that are actually educating uh, members of Congress as to how we might solve these problems before we have uh, litigation like uh, litigation you're talking about. So forgive me, but I'm going to stay away from commenting on exactly what they should do and why they should do it, because I just think that's one elected official sticking his nose into uh, something that uh, our judicial folks, God bless them, but they better figure this area out. And they better follow concepts that this country was based on, uh, has been based on, which is freedom and opportunity. Uh, this should not be government uh, like the Communist Party of China, you know, using this as a data collection uh, process and trying to control the entire uh, ecosystem, financial ecosystem. This should be about the United States of America, where we allow people like you and your viewers to get out there and create the next great opportunity that not only benefits you personally, right? Because people want to improve their own personal situation. But by doing that, they lift all boats around them. And that's what we got to be about. Absolutely. You, know, you mentioned about the privacy concerns, and I interviewed Chris Giancarlo, former CFTC chairman, and he was part of the Digital Dollar Project. And you know, one of the questions I brought up was, and he did, to be fair, he said there still has to be dialogue around this. If the digital dollar, the United States CBDC is released, how does that align with our Constitution and Bill of Rights, especially with, when it comes to privacy? Because to your point, we don't want to be like China and they're collecting all the data and everything you do. And so I'm curious if that conversation or, or dialogue is happening and if you participate in it or is still too early. Oh, no. No, I'm, I'm heavily involved in that discussion because I think this is where we need to separate ourselves from the Communist Party of China. We got to make sure that whether it's our Treasury Secretary or our SEC chair or our uh, Fed chair, they got to understand the, the United States of America, the government has never done something better than the private sector. Never. I, I will tell you right now, I don't care if it's even building a road or a bridge. Uh, <laughs> private sector does a much better job than the federal government would ever do. And the federal government should not be in business competing with its private citizens, especially in this area. But the uh, uh, it, when you brought up Chris, I'm thinking, what was he, Crypto Daddy or something? What's his name? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Crypto Dad. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty, yeah, Crypto Dad, whatever it is. It's pretty funny. My uh, staff guy showed me some of this stuff, and I just laughed. He's it, perfect for him. But, you know, he's a great example, right? Uh, Giancarlo, uh, in his position at the CFPC, you would never have guessed that Chris would have jumped into this area the way he did. But he recognizes, based on just basic principles of freedom, uh, you know, the right to self-determine that we have in this country, that we've got to protect that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and when we talk about a digital currency, no, I don't think our government, unless they can produce a digital currency that's peer-to-peer, -peer, that's uh, completely private, that uh, you don't have, you have the same protections you have with cash, for instance, right? Right. Uh, our uh, real cash, uh, unless we can do that, our government should not be involved in that. Uh, because you really, it, it's, it's the same problem I've had with FISA courts, right? Uh, and some of your listeners might be going, what? what's he talking about now? Well, we created this court system that's separate from our, our regular court system that allows our federal government to go in front of special judges and ask for permission to spy on people, typically, foreign agents, right? 
Mm -hmm. But those of us that don't like it said years ago when they created it, the problem is your government's always going to want to go a little too far, right? And we found out whether it was Edward Snowden or whoever it might be that our government did go too far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we found out in the last administration, they used these courts because they wanted to spy on American citizens. They wanted to spy on a campaign, whether you agree with that or not. That's what they were doing. Yeah. It's the same issue here. Uh, you create a central bank digital currency. Okay, we can talk about it. our federal government would never collect data like they do in China. Come on, Tony. We're all good people here. Remember, I'm from Minnesota. We're just <laughs> a little bit better than the average person here in Minnesota. Uh, you can trust all of us. Mm. Yeah. Until you can. Until you can. And just think about what happened when the, uh, when the virus broke out within the last year in China, right? Uh, they were able to take their digital currency and literally lock their citizens down. You have a card that you use to transact business uh, with, the, with the yuan, right? <laughs> they were able to lock your card down and restrict your ability to use that card to when the government wanted you to be able to use that card. So it's not just about data collection. And we had a, a hearing recently in the House where I brought this up and these people started laughing at me. And I said, you go ahead and laugh. You go ahead and laugh because this is exactly the risk that we're looking at. And the people who want to be ignorant to it today, uh, they're going to pay the price tomorrow. So I think uh, myself and my colleagues, Republican and Democrat alike, by the way, that uh, value our privacy, uh, we're going to make sure that we uh, not only stay involved in the discussion, Tony, but we're going to push back every step of the way when the government tries to take advantage. Uh, because, look, uh, people that are watching your podcast, people that are paying attention to what you and I are talking about, right now they already know if the United States of America doesn't get its act together soon, if it doesn't start uh, clarifying the rules of the road so they know what they, they're responsible for, what they're not responsible for, how they can operate, uh, if, we can, if we go down this Communist Party of China road uh, where it can potentially be about data collection, uh, guess what? They'll just take their opportunities elsewhere. And that's not what we want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I appreciate you fighting the good fight on that front. Um, obviously, without our rights, our constitution, uh, you know, I don't know where we would be. So we have to maintain that. Um, I want to talk about Bitcoin adoption. We have corporates putting Bitcoin in their balance sheet. We have El Salvador looking to make it a legal tender. Uh, it seems like there's Bitcoin mining boom happening in the United States, which I'm happy about. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, what are you seeing on, on your end? Well, we, we've got to get our accounting standards in this country uh, uh, set, clarified, right? Mm. Uh, the, uh, the United States actually should welcome uh, uh, crypto. Uh, and we should allow, we should create our, and I've been involved in this uh, so far, trying to get our accounting standards set so that uh, companies can hold crypto as assets and they can account for them on their balance sheet. I think this is really important and I think this will be the next big breakthrough. Unfortunately, right now, uh, the uh, parties that are involved have been dragging their feet. Mm. Why? Uh, that's a great question. You know, it's, uh, you and I were talking about this a little bit before we, uh, we started the podcast. You realize in a country of over 300 million people, we now have 50 million people plus in this country who are involved in crypto. Yeah. Tony, it ain't going away. No. And whatever these, uh, these government bureaucrats or, and or these uh, third parties that are involved in setting accounting standards, et cetera, whatever they might think, <laughs> they, they got to put their personal opinions to the side. Crypto is here to stay. Uh, we've got to have accounting standards that apply to the 21st century. Uh, once, once this gets cleared up, right? So you, when you're, you've got it on your balance sheet, uh, you watch uh, crypto take off. You watch it uh, take off because part of the reason we have crypto, right? Uh, as uh, the Satoshi white paper would tell us is when uh, you've got a government that's manipulating its currency, right? And uh, guess what? Maybe the currency's, uh, I, I'm not going to suggest that the currency's not reliable, but people have some questions uh, when uh, government continues to print money. 
uh, when it has a floating currency and uh, it doesn't seem to have any restrictions whatsoever. In fact, the spending, look at what we're doing right now. And inflation, huh. You know, our government, uh, our monetary policy, think about this for a second and all your listeners. You know, you've got the Federal Reserve in this country that targets 2% inflation. What kind of criminals are they? Uh, now I'm, I'm probably going to be in trouble for saying that. But if you think about it, they're taking 2% of my parents and soon me, they're taking 2% of what I earned over the life of my career, which I have in retirement, and they're taxing me. And they say it as though, oh, this is good monetary policy. Our target for inflation is 2% per year. And you know, we're under our target. You know, I don't want you to hit your target. I want my money to maintain the value that it had when I put it in the account to begin with. What same human being would say, this makes sense. My government should inflate its currency by a minimum of 2% every year because I'm giving them more of the hard-earned money that I, uh, that I, I actually saved over the course of my uh, working life. Uh, insane. And right now, what you have with inflation running rampant, because look, what our government did is, is uh, pretty insane. It has printed a whole bunch of money flooded the marketplace with cash. You have a pandemic, which created all kinds of inequities in the marketplace, the supply chains. You have supply chains that are interrupted. You have supply chains that are limited. So now you've got goods and services that are getting pinched, right? And you also have an incentive, a disincentive that our government created by, by enhancing unemployment benefits. Human beings are smart too. They, do, they can do basic math. Yeah. Then they sit there and say, okay, I can go to work and I can, I can earn X per hour, or my government's giving me the opportunity to sit at home and do nothing and make Y per hour, X plus Y. Huh, I wonder what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit at home. So you got that problem. And then you have pent up demand, Tony, that, uh, you know, you've got a year and a half where you've got a lot of people who have been locked up, who have been locked down. They're coming out. They want, to, they want to spend all that cash that's been flooded into the marketplace. And guess what? It is driving prices up. So what do people do? They look at crypto. They look at things like Bitcoin, right? Which has more of an element like gold. It, it's a scarce resource. You aren't going to be able to just float this thing and create all kinds of additional Bitcoin. Uh, it's going to be more reliable. And if that's the case, then why shouldn't we uh, recognize this is here to stay. Therefore, we got to update our accounting standards so that whether it's an individual like you or me, or it's a, uh, a major business, an entity that wants to hold this as an asset on its balance sheet, it's able to account for it in a, uh, a fair and honest way. I think it's coming, but uh, for some reason, you got people out in the marketplace that are delaying. Mm. I, I want to ask, and it's you know, was not really a question I thought of initially, but since we're on the topic, how do we, how do we fix this debt-based system? Because <laughs> how long can we continue on this inflation and, and, you know, every whatever year, number of years, how do we get to like a hard cap um, and it's more deflationary? And, and, and I, I know this may be a very, tough question to answer because it's maybe a, a reset of the UN, United States financial system and possibly global. I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not too educated as, you know, as far as how all that work, how it would work with the IMF, but how do we get out of this cycle where we don't head into like a Venezuela situation of hyperinflation and things like that? Well, it's not just Venezuela. I mean, what makes us think that we're better than the Weimar Republic, right? Sure. What makes us think we're better than the Soviet Union of the 1990s? Uh, it's not just Venezuela. You know, it's, it's an arrogance. We're lucky. We are the world's reserve currency, which uh, makes the U.S., uh, gives the U.S. a bit of an advantage. Uh, it really uh, will, it will change when people don't uh, believe in the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And uh, there is a risk. I'm not going to be here uh, sounding the alarm that this is imminent, but I'm going to tell you, uh, and by the way, they want you and me, they want us to think that, oh, we're not smart enough, Tony. We, we don't understand it. Yeah, we are. We're smart enough. 
I mean, these guys have been playing this game for years. 1972, we went off the gold standard in this country. Republicans did. Richard Nixon. Uh, really dumb. Because at that point, and, and now there are, are economists and brilliant Ivy League uh, uh, diplomas out there that are a lot smarter than I'll ever be. But you know what? I got something called common sense that uh, I'll put up against their diploma any day. You took our currency off the gold standard, which it didn't have to be a gold standard. It needed to be pegged against some value, right? Right. Uh, no, you've made it a floating currency. And I would argue from that day forward, what you did is you created a economy that is based on debt creation as opposed to wealth creation. Mm-hmm. Up to that point, you know, you're creating wealth uh, and you're raising all boats. Now, what you do from 1972 on is because you have this floating currency, you start to have this separation. You start to have, you know, and by the way, we've accelerated it since 2008. Because what did you do with all your government regulation? Well, if you're going to survive, you got to be bigger. You know, you you actually made it tougher for the little guy, Main Street uh, USA, to grow and to survive and thrive. You started to create a hollow out the middle class. This is Republicans and Democrats alike. And I would is uh, you created policies that in order for our financial institutions to, to survive, they got to start sucking up every uh, community bank that's out there. They got to get bigger and bigger. It's, it's, it's absolutely the wrong, I, I believe, the wrong headed approach to, uh, to creating what we really should be doing, which is wealth. And now you've littered the White House with these guys, which uh, I'm not going to be very kind uh, when I talk about modern monetary theory. Uh, these are children with uh, with Ivy League degrees is what they are. They are people that believe there are no consequences for our actions. These modern monetary theorists actually believe debt doesn't matter. Why do they believe debt doesn't matter? Because if debt matters, then they can't keep doing what they're doing, right? They can't keep printing cash and spending. And you asked if it's a U.S. problem or a global problem. It's absolutely a global problem. This is the, you know, the, the idea that the rich get richer and the poor get poor. That's what we did, which is why you got crypto that suddenly comes on the scene in a big way after the 2008 crash, because there were some very, you know, probably not Ivy League degrees necessarily, Tony, but there are people out there that went, wait a second, uh, this is not the way you do it. I want to have something that's more stable that I can rely on. And right now, my government has not given me the confidence that they know what they're doing when it comes to this. And, you know, you you politicize these Democrats and Republicans alike talk about the Federal Reserve. Oh, we can't politicize the Federal Reserve because our monetary policy has to be apolitical. I don't give you that crap anymore. You've absolutely politicized the Federal Reserve. You think you're supposed to be involved in, in determining what full employment is? Really? That's the Federal Reserve's job. We somehow gave the Federal Reserve the ability. Look, you go back and study financial or monetary history in this country. Before the Federal Reserve, yes. Big loss, big loss. Yes, we did. But you think we solved that by creating the Federal Reserve? No. 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 And we've got some work to do, Tony. But this is why crypto has come onto the scene in such a strong way. And this is why these, uh, I believe, the conspiracy theorist in me, is there are bureaucrats here at home and around the world that see crypto as a threat because sure. crypto quite quickly empowers the individual. It empowers Tony and Tom to literally do business together without having the third party uh, government uh, saying to both of us, you got to pay the VIG. Hey, man, you got to pay the VIG. You know, we're, we're the, uh, it's, it's uh yeah now I'm gonna get in big trouble, but it's like <laughs> the uh, the mob. It's like the mob coming in and saying you gotta pay me, man. I, oh I'm boy, I'm the third party that you don't see, but I'm gonna protect both of you. Yeah. Um, so do you think despite you know the pushback that we're seeing and and to the point of <clears throat> giving power to the common man and the little guy again, that ultimately they these governments could take 
a Bitcoin, which is hard cap and it's open and transparent on the blockchain or an XRP or whatever else it is, and use that as a digital goal and go back to a gold standard. Could that potentially happen? Could that be a scenario? I don't think these guys can do that. I don't think, you know, the people that are currently in control, I just don't think they could ever see doing that. Mm. That's the last thing they want because that doesn't allow them to manipulate things, right? But I think the community, Tony, has already started to take back our individual authority. Uh, you know, government in some respects is trying to slow that down, but we're already leaning in and saying, hey, man, I mean, this really is a reaction to too much government. Yeah. And to too much manipulation. These are, uh, you know, maybe we don't all have an Ivy League degree. Maybe we don't all come from these silk stockings and lacy underwear families, right? Yeah. Uh, we're just common uh, people from around the globe that are saying, wait a second. You guys have been manipulating this for far too long for someone's advantage. Certainly not mine uh, or my family. So, look, I'm going to look at something that's more stable. I'm going to look at something that, uh, you know, may actually provide that level of security that I don't have to worry about my government uh, destroying. Uh, this is the fight I think that's going on in the shadows uh, that we should probably call out. That's really what's going on here. Absolutely. Um, I have a few more questions. I know we're running up on time here. Uh, do you own any NFTs? <laughs> no, I do not right now. But uh, you know what? I think NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens, are a great opportunity, and they're just starting to, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, whether it's uh, you know art, art dealers uh, or artists, right, uh, or specific uh, specialty uh, uh, industries that want to get into NFTs, you know, from the asset standpoint, I just think it's so early. I think the opportunity uh, where uh, where NFTs are going to go. Uh, it's anyone's guess right now. Um, final question before we get into the rapid fire ones. Um, when is blockchain coming to voting? Because I've heard some talks about that. It could help improve voter, uh, reduce voter fraud and all, you know, inaccuracies and things like that. Any any updates you can share there? You know, to the, to the Republicans, Democrats, and others that are out there listening, I love the fact that our government said, somebody in government said, this was the most transparent most honest, best election we've ever had in this country. Wow. But think about this for a second. In a country where you and I can order something today online and we can watch it travel from the point of sale, the yep. point of origin, through the supply chain right at our front door, I can't do the same thing with a ballot? Yeah. Really? Uh, so when, when it's going to happen, Tony, is when our government, uh, more importantly, are public. And again, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I don't care what your political persuasion is. When you stand up and say, you know what, I want to make sure that I know where all these ballots are coming from. And I don't want anybody to be questioning my candidate when he or she wins. And I don't want to have to question uh, somebody else's candidate when they when they win. Uh, as soon as we get that as a, uh, as a society, we get to that place where we uh, we have that momentum, it'll get done because there are so many things that the blockchain uh, platform could provide to us. It's not just uh, uh, clarity when it comes to our elections. Just think about cybersecurity, right? right? We've got all these cybersecurity issues that we could be solving. And I, I think the future is really bright. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So I don't know when, <laughs> but I do believe it's an end. Awesome. Uh, so final rapid fire questions such as what's your favorite food? Meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> favorite music <laughs> or bad? Uh, you know what? You can't limit me here. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be rock and roll. Uh, it's going to be, uh, believe it or not, it's going to be the stones and stuff like that, but then it's going to be country and there's going to be some jazz thrown in there too. Nice. I'm the same way. I listen to a variety of music, but I, I'm, I do gravitate more to classic rock. You know, I'll put it down if I'm working out or something. So. Amen. Uh, Amen. <laughs> favorite movie? Uh, the Natural. Ooh, good Robert one. Robert Redford and The Natural. I don't know why. I just, I, I probably watch it once a year at least. Awesome. Uh, favorite book? 
The Once and Future King by T.H. White. Very nice. And when you're not doing your congressional duties, uh, what, what is what is your hobby, you know, your, your favorite pastime? You know, if it's not with my family, which is number one, right? Hanging out with my kids. Now uh, our first grandchild, it's going to be hunting. It's going to be fishing, which I haven't had much time for the last couple of years. And then uh, if, if I'm hanging out at home with Jackie with nothing to do, uh, there's a hobby I picked up a couple of years ago. I might be making a, uh, a batch of beer. Oh, very nice. Very nice. That, that's a, that sounds like a good hobby. <laughs> it is. It's a great hobby. Um, Congressman Emmer, just such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for everything you're doing, fighting the good fight. And I, I thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Tony, it was fun. Uh, keep the faith, keep working, keep the, uh, the masses, uh, keep them energized. We got to make sure that our government understands how important this whole industry is. Mm-hmm.